it started on this series. <laughs> uh, I'm looking at Lee because we've talked about the new series, and I switched it on you, Lee. So you're like, what? I thought he was going to do that one. Um, so today, obviously, is Mother's Day. We're going to be talking about moms and Mother's Day, hopefully to bring encouragement and to bring strength to all of us as we look to Scripture. And then starting next week and throughout the summer, we're going to go to the Old Testament because it's good for us to have a balanced diet of both the Old and the New Testament. So we are going to turn over this summer to the book of Proverbs is where we're going to turn. And so I laid out this series for this summer. And no, I'm not going to cover every single proverb, okay? You're like, this is going to be 14 years in the Proverbs. So it's, we're going to go to Proverbs, and we're going to go through, um, a, you know, lots of Scripture there, looking at God's wisdom for us to walk in. And I imagine that it'll be very, very helpful for each and every one of us. So we're going to look to that next week, okay? But this morning, we are focusing in on my Moms. And aren't you grateful for moms? I'm going to say amen to that right there, right? We are grateful for moms. And Mother's Day can be an emotional day for many people. And by the way, there are notes in the back if you want them. Those online, there's notes that should be there somewhere in the chat room. And, um, and yes, and if you would like to, of course, during the message portion, you're free to drop your masks in this space downstairs. Uh, they're keeping them on upstairs. They're off all the time. So you do have options here. So again, Mother's Day can be an emotional day for many people. For some, it brings great joy and happiness. It's a day in which you are looking forward to all year long, and your children and your spouse celebrate you well, and that is the case for some of us, okay? For some, it brings great sorrow over children lost, or children never held, or children that were, were never. And for some, it brings great grief of strains and pains of relationships that have been difficult, or a mother that is no longer with us. And some of you moms are just plain tired, right? We say amen to that because being a mom and a grandmother is completely and exhausting at times. Now, many, uh, not all of us are mothers, right? And some for obvious reasons, all right? Not all of us are mothers. But we were all once children. And children like to be watched. Now, do you remember when you were a child where you would either pull on your mom's um, pant leg or call out to your dad, hey, mom, mom, or dad, dad, watch me, watch me, watch me. Has any of you guys ever done that, right? We've all done that. I think it's in the heart of children to be observed by their parents, regardless of how goofy we are at times. There's something about mom watching us. Or there's something about dad watching us. And there is a bond there and a connection. And all of us like to be seen. But many of you have also been a mom who wonders if you are seen. Because there comes the point as a mom where you begin to think that perhaps you are invisible. Now, Nicole Johnson has written an insightful article called I Am Invisible that gives words to what many moms feel. And I'm going to read a part of it, and there's links there in your note if you, notes if you want to read the whole um, blog post that she put together. But this is how she opened it. She says, it all began to make sense. The blank stares. The lack of response. The way one of the kids will walk into the room while I'm on the phone and ask to be taken to the store. And inside I'm thinking, can't you see I'm on the phone? Obviously not. No one can see if I'm on the phone or cooking or sweeping the floor, or even standing on my head in the corner because no one can see me at Oh, I am invisible. Now, some days, I'm only a pair of hands, nothing more. Can you fix this? Can you tie this? 
Can you open this? Some days, I'm not even a pair of hands. I'm not even a human being. I'm a clock to ask. Mom, what time is it? I'm a satellite guide to answer. What number is the Disney Channel? I'm a taxi driver. Pick me up at 5.30 and don't be late. Now, I was certain, she writes, that these were the hands that once held books <laughs> and eyes that studied history and a mind that graduated top of the class. But now, they had all disappeared into the peanut butter, never to be seen again. She's going, going, gone. So I don't know if you feel that way today, but I bet that all of us at some time in our existence have felt invisible, unnoticed, unappreciated, not seen. So this morning, we're going to look at a biblical account of a mother who I imagine felt invisible and unknown. And from her story, we will learn about ourselves, and we will learn about the goodness of God. And we all, moms, dads, children, all of us, will be strengthened and encouraged by the God who sees us. So go ahead and grab your Bible. Please open up to Genesis chapter 16. And we're going to read about this mom and her circumstance in one spot. And then we'll turn to another spot near the end to see the continuation of her story. So this is Genesis chapter 16, starting with verse 1. And I'm going to read all the way down to verse 16, and then we're going to take a look at what we find in this passage. Now, Sarai, which is Abraham's wife, had bore him no children. But she had an Egyptian servant named Hagar. So she said to Abram, The Lord has kept me from having children. Go, sleep with my servant. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarai said. This is Abraham and Sarah, by the way, before God changed their name. So after Abram had been living in Cana ten years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian servant Hagar and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar, and she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, you are responsible for the wrong I'm suffering. I put my servant in your arms, and now that she knows she's pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Your servant is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think best. Then Sarai mistreated Hagar, so she fled from her. Now the angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was a spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? I am running away from my mistress Sarai, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord also said to her, You are now pregnant, and you will give birth to a son. You shall name him Ishmael, 
For the Lord has heard of your misery. Now he will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand will be against him. And he will live in hostility towards all his brothers. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. This is why the well was called Bir Lama Roy. It is still there between Kadesh and Bibred. So Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram gave the name Ishmael to the son she had bore. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. It's quite a story, isn't it? A little scandalous for sure, but from it we will see some interesting and profound points for us. First, we look at the situation. Hagar, we're focusing primarily upon her and her interaction with God. She was feeling unknown and unseen, like some of us and perhaps some of us even right now, but all of us at some time in our existence have felt this way. So in this account, in this story, we meet a mother, Hagar. She is an immigrant from Egypt and probably has no sense of belonging. And she has lost her connection to her family. There was no cell phones. There was no mail. Uh, There was no way to communicate. So she was alone. She was separated. And she lost her sense of belonging and connection to her place of origin. She, in this account, is running away from a household where her body had been used to produce offspring for an infertile couple. Now, tragically, like many people, Hagar is unknown, unseen, mistreated. She's trapped in a system where she feels as though she is invisible, like a non-person. She has no rights, she has no dignity, she has no freedom, and very little choice. And she has had enough. It's awful hard to be a nobody with no name. Now Moses, the author of the first five books of the Bible, he names her, okay? It says Hagar, but if you notice in the dialogue that Abram and Sarah never call her by name. They call her the Egyptian. They call her the servant. They didn't even acknowledge her personhood And just gave her titles. She was there to serve a purpose. To serve them in ways they saw fit. A difficult, horrible place to be. Now there's a person in this story that calls her by name. It is God himself. He calls her by name in verse 8, if you look back, and we'll go back to some of these verses. Calls her by name, Hagar. And not only does he know her name, he knows so very much more. And from this interaction, she gained what she needed to continue to move forward in his strength and his Planned. Out of this difficult situation for her, God speaks to her. And God is speaking to you today as well. Because God knows your name as well. He knows your circumstances as well. He knows the very hairs that are on your body and he knows Not just the exterior, but the interior of 
your heart. I want you to be encouraged by that. He hasn't lost track of you. He knows you better than anyone, better than anything. He knows you perfectly. I want that to sink into your heart if you're feeling alone, abandoned, mistreated, or invisible. Understand, this is the next point, that God sees you. God sees you. If we can go back to the text to verse 7, please, on the screens. Okay, I want you to follow along with these points, okay? I'm pulling out some things from this text. You can do the same thing. And when you read it, I want you to do the same thing. What does this text say about me? And what does this text say about God, okay? When you read the Bible, I want you to ask those questions. What does this say about me? What does this say about God? And we're still going to see those things from this text. So the first sub-point, understanding that God sees you, is the Lord pursues you. You see this in verse 7. The angel of the Lord found Hagar. She was not even looking for God. Did you catch that? She was running away. She didn't know what she wanted, but she did know what she didn't want. She didn't want that, so she was taking off. And in this place of uh, difficulty, of hurt, of abandonment, of invisibility, so to speak, God found her. Aren't you glad that God pursues you? Come on, right? When you are running, God runs to meet you. The truth is God's already there. So we know this about God, in particular for those who are in difficult circumstances. God pursues you. And that's good news. If you have run, if you are running, or if you have loved ones who are running, God pursue them. Because God knows exactly where they are. God knows exactly where you are, and you are seen by him. And then we see this. The angel of the Lord found Hagar, knowing her name, right? He says this again. Hagar calls her by name. So the Lord calls you by name. You are not an unnamed production unit. God cares more about you than what he can get from you. Are you hearing me? Often we say, I want God to use me. The deal is God doesn't use anybody. He includes people. Are you hearing me? He will, God, include me in your plan. God makes us and forms us and fashions us and calls us according to his purpose. And he says, come, follow me. Meets us wherever we may be. He calls you by name. And we see this all over the New Testament as well. As Jesus walks along the sea, Peter, Simon, follow me, Andrew, James, John, follow me. So he knows your name, and he calls you by name, and he truly sees you. Truly sees you. We have this passage in the Old Testament where where the prophet was looking for the next king of Israel. And had all the boys of Jesse come in front of him and said, well, this one's impressive. Obviously, he's the next king. And the the Lord said, no, not him, not him, not him, not him. And out comes this little runt of a boy at that time, forgotten in the fields by his father, wasn't even included in coming to be lined up to see perhaps if this one could be the king. And the Lord says, yeah. That's the one. And he says these verses in 1 Samuel chapter 16. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Now man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. 
And that should be good news for us who feel like the outward appearance isn't a whole lot to look at, right? And unfortunately, we put a great emphasis on this stuff. Because people see this stuff. But guess what? God sees this stuff, and more importantly, he sees what's here. Sees what's here. If you feel like, well, I'm not enough, I'm not pretty enough, I'm not handsome enough, I'm not strong enough, I'm not athletic enough, it's not about this, it's about this. Take courage, my friend. He not only sees you, your physical sense, but he sees you. And a totality of who you are. That helps us, and we get so blinded by making quick judgments about the external. God, help us to see with his eyes. We'll say amen. Not just what's here, but what's here. Come on. Help us with that. The Lord calls you by name, verse 7 and verse 8. Going back to verse 7, if you can pull that back up again, again, right from the text. The Lord knows where you are. This is specific. It was the spring that is beside the road to shore. He knows exactly where you are. (laughs) I'm in Rockford, Illinois. Who knows about Rockford, right? When I go and travel, I tell people I'm from Rockford. They're like, where? And this is kind of a big city. So I'll say, like you probably say, by Chicago. Right. Oh, now I know. And this town that most people drive through, here we are. And this place in which she was traveling from one place to another, God saw her and knows exactly where she was. You are not forgotten, and there is nowhere where you can go that he is not there. The psalmist, in one of our favorite psalms, Psalm 139, talking about God's interaction from us. He says this. He says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee that you are not present? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. If I rise of the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, well, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me. Even a darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is of light to you. Everywhere you go, there he is. Everywhere. Talk to Jonah. He'll tell you about that in the belly of a whale. <clears throat> the good news is, you can run, but you cannot hide. The good news is, God knows where you are physically, but he knows where you are internally, spiritually, mentally, emotionally. He knows. If you feel like you have never been understood, let me tell you, let me remind you that God understands you. And we get this right from the text. The God who sees. And then we learn some more things about God. And these things should give us strength. These should give us encouragement. They should help us trust in him. The Lord knows what is. The Lord knows what to do. The Lord knows what will be. The Lord sees you. You can trust him. So he goes on to tell her, right? The Lord knows what is. Verse 8, okay? We flip up to verse 8, please. Hagar, servant of Sarai. He knows what she was. Now, it's interesting that she did not necessarily deliver her from this difficult situation at that time. He encouraged her. He strengthened her. He told her what to do. And she had the power to then go go back and do God's plan at that moment. But he knows what is. When I go to prayer, and when you go to prayer, you're not giving God any more information, 
right? You don't say to him, God, I just want to let you know it's kind of difficult right now for me, right? God's like, oh, thanks. I didn't know, right? He's not taking notes, right? We can pray, God, thank you for understanding my circumstance. And God, my heart feels this way. It helps us. God, who sees, can you help me? This is my request to you. May you be glorified. God, I need your help. But God knows what is. And he knows what to do. And notice, if you go back in the text, he asked her a question. If you go back a couple of verses, please. He asked her some questions. Okay? Let's go back just a little bit more. I'll go back. Ah. Verse 8, sorry. He said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from, and where are you going? You think God was looking for information? And I've noticed every time in my heart when God asks me a question, he wants me to think about something that I'm not thinking about. <laughs> and so in asking that, he wasn't asking, oh, uh, uh, who are you again? Uh, you don't have a name tag on. And, and where, are you go- where are you coming from? Where are you going? He asks her questions, and he asks you questions to make you think. Well, where am I from? Who am I? What am I? And where are you going? Hey, God. She knew what she was running from, but she didn't remember the things that God had yet already done for her. And often when we run... We don't see the whole picture. And often when we run, we don't see where we are going. But God knows. He knows what is. And he knows what to do. So we asked her a question to get get her thinking. She responds, I'm running away from the mistress. Sarah, she answered, go to the next verse, verse 9. And then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. Do you think she wanted to hear that? God doesn't always tell us to do what's easy, but when he tells us to do something, it is best. He promises to go with us. He promises to be with us. And he gives her strength and gives you strength to go on. He knows what to do based on what he knows about you, based upon what he knows about the circumstance, based upon what he knows about the future. Wouldn't it be great if you and I knew the future? Surely all of us will be filthy rich, right? I know who's going to win the Super Bowl. One million dollar bet. If you knew, right? If you knew beyond a shadow of doubt, you exactly know what to do. Guess what? Newsflash. God knows the future. God knows what's going to happen. So when he tells us to do something, it isn't based on speculation. It's based on perfect knowledge. And so it may not under, you may not understand it at the moment, and there's been plenty of times in which I did not see the big picture, but all I needed to see was him. And so the response is, if there's a God who sees me, if there's a God who knows what is, if there's a God who knows the future, you can trust him. He's for you, not against you. Will it always be easy? The answer is no. Will it always be good? Oh, yeah. Will it be right? Yes. Because his ultimate goal is to conform you into the image of his son. You think going to the cross was easy for Jesus? 
It was not easy, but it was worth it. So this is what he tells us. He knows what to do. He knows what will be. He sees it all. He knows all of the days ordained for us. Written in his book before they came to be. So the Lord sees you. Trust in him. You're not forgotten. You're not abandoned. His plan continues to play out. He promises to never leave you nor forsake you. Surely I'll be with you always. When? Even to the ends of the earth. Matthew 28. From the lips of Jesus. He'll be with you. He will reward you. He will help you. So seek him. This is why we pray. God, help me. I feel invisible. I feel abandoned. I feel disconnected. This situation is not to my liking. So the response from Scripture is seek him. Seek wisdom. Seek counsel. He promises that if we seek him, he'll be found by us. From his word, by his spirit, by his servants, he will help. And this is the next point. Understand that God helps you. Hagar, in her difficulty, saw an aspect of God that she would have not have seen if it wasn't for her difficulty. You, in your situation, God will use it to show an aspect of himself that you would not see otherwise. Are you hearing me? The ultimate goal is to conform us to his image so that we could glorify God. In order to glorify God, we have to know God. In order to know God, we have to experience him. In order to experience him, we have to go through some things that will allow us to experience him in different ways. That's what he's doing. Hasn't abandoned you. Hasn't forgotten you. He is with you. And he will help you. So here's Hagar. This woman whose body is being used, who's having relational difficulties, feeling unconnected, feeling unloved, feeling unwanted, and she is scurried away. And in her conversation with a God who sees, gives her clarification and also determination to do what he tells her to do. Go back. What? He says, go back. Trust me. And sometimes he tells us to go on, but sometimes he tells us to go back. And so because of this conversation with a God who knows her name, she listened, she trusted, and she returned. And God's promise did become true even to her. So let's turn the pages. Let's go to Genesis chapter 21 as we look at the rest of the story. Genesis 21. We're going to pick it up in verse 8. We're going to go down to 16. I am reading from the NIV often. Use ESV sometimes, NIV. So having this interaction with God gave Hagar, the unnamed, uninvisible servant, courage and strength to go back. And the story was not over. (laughs) She came to a very difficult time again. (laughs) When God tells you to do something, he'll go with you to do it give you the strength to do it. But he doesn't say it won't be difficult at times. So here we go, verse 8, Genesis 21. The child grew and was weaned. And on the day Isaac was weaned, this is another child, Abraham held a great feast from Abraham and Sarah at this point. 
God miraculously gave him this child. Abraham had, had a great feast, held a great feast. But Sarah, now named change, saw that the son whom Hagar, the Egyptian, see this title, <laughs> had bore to Abraham, was mocking. Okay. Here's this young child who knows what, how, what age children at that time were weaned. Okay, maybe he's five, maybe he's three. I don't even know how old he is. Somehow he was mocking. Right? And she, who is Sarah, said to Abraham, her husband, get rid of that slave woman. Notice, still not seen. And her son, for that woman's son, will never share in the inheritance with my son. Isaac. There are many good reasons, by the way, not to have multiple wives. <laughs> Just saying. I got the most response from that statement of everything I've said. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> not to have multiple children by different people. The matter distressed Abraham greatly. Yeah, I bet it did. Because it concerned his son. But God said to him, Do not be so distressed about the boy and your servant or slave. Listen to whatever Sarah tells you. Because it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. And I will make the son of the slave woman into a nation also. Because he is your offspring. Doesn't sound real good for Hagar here, does it? So early the next morning, verse 14, Abraham took some food and a skin of water and gave them to Hagar. He set them on her shoulders and then sent her off with the boy. So she went on her way and wandered in the desert of Beersheba. Now, can you imagine the conversation she perhaps had with God at that point? Hey, God. She didn't probably say it this nicely. I followed you. I did something I didn't want to do. I trusted you. I raised this kid in this situation. Sarah still doesn't see me. Abraham still doesn't acknowledge and it seems like the only thing Abraham is concerned about is not me, but this boy. And God, you promised me some things, and now here I am. With some food and some water that's surely going to run out. No tent. Nothing. And this forsaken place. Could you imagine what was going on in her? <laughs> Another step away. Servant, a slave, forsaken utterly. Well, this is what I have. Be gone with you. God, where are you? And she walked for a while at least long enough for the food and water to run out. Verse 15. When the water in the skin was gone, could you imagine this? She put the boy under one of the bushes. And she went off and she sat down about a bow shot away. That's what she thought. I cannot watch this boy die. 
she sat there, she began to sob. I don't know if you with your children have gotten to the end of your resources. You feel like everything has run out and you can't do this anymore. That you can't be the mom to this child or these children. You can't provide what these kids need. There's no more strength. There's no more resource. And you can't go on. You are literally at the end of your rope. All you can do is sit there and cry. That is this situation. But all hope is not lost. The God who sees, the God who hears, the God who is faithful will come to your aid. Verse 17. God heard the boy crying. And the angel of God, often Old Testament, this is Jesus himself, called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, what's the matter, Hagar? And addresses her biggest need. Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Now go, lift the boy up and take him by the hand. For I will be faithful to my promise to you. I will make him into a great nation. Can you imagine this slave woman with this child who is unwanted, roaming in the desert, ready to die? God telling her, I'll make him into a great nation? (laughs) What are you talking about? But God delights to take nothing and make, oh, so much more. God delights in taking the abandoned or the the abused or the mistreated and calling him to himself to make something so far greater so that God will be glorified and we will be satisfied in him. Do you see this plan? Yes, you are going to go through some stuff. But he will not abandon you. He knows your name. He sees you and he will hold you by the hand. Lift the boy up, take him by the hand. I will make him into a great nation. Then God, some of my favorite verses in the Bible, then God did what? Open her eyes. And she saw a well of water. She had tears and watering in his eyes. He said, I know this is your experience, but let me show some, you some different water. Let me show you a better resource. Let me show you how I'm going to help you. Apparently she could not see it after she called out. She was just crying. Again, God met her and says, let me show you some things that I have for you. Some resources that you haven't created, but I have in store for you. God delights in doing this. He's not limited by your resources because he is the source of everything. I have something for you that you don't even know about. And we pray, God, open my eyes. Help me to see what's here. And she saw a well of water. So she went and filled the skin with water and gave a boy a drink. And this is the postscript. This is the epilogue. God was with the boy. God was with this boy. As he grew up, God faithfully provided for her. He didn't tell them at this point to go back. He says, okay, you did what I told you. You were provided for there. I have provided for you there now. This is a new situation. I will be with you. And he lived in the desert. He became an archer. While he was living in the desert of Paran, his mother got a wife for him from Egypt. God helps you. Do not be afraid. The number one reason given to us not to be afraid in Scripture 
is that God is with us. That's the reason he gives. Do not be afraid because I'm with you. He doesn't say, do not be afraid because they're wimps. He doesn't say, don't be afraid because this situation is nah. He doesn't say that. Don't, don't be afraid. Why? Because I'm with you. And greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. We overcome not because of our great strength, because of his. And us giving ourselves to him. The Lord is your helper. Isaiah 41, some of my favorite verses. For I, the Lord, your God, hold your right hand. It is I who say to you, fear not. I am the one who helps you. There is a future in the love of the Lord. His plan is not lost, even though you may feel abandoned or be abandoned. Even though that you're at the end of everything, he'll take you by the hand, he will help you, he will strengthen you, he will encourage you, he is with you, he sees you. Hear this. It doesn't necessarily change your circumstances, but it gives us strength to go on. He is the great hope. He is the great friend. He is the great God. Holds you by the hand. He opens our eyes to his provision. And it's outside of us, but it's not outside of him. And I want to encourage all of you, especially you feel visible or end of the rope, cry out to God. Help. See his provision, so that you can go on. He will be faithful to his promises. So let us, then, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace, Hebrews 4.16, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That's good news. That's an invitation to the God of creation. In your time of need, come to me. Receive mercy. Find grace to help. And we need grace for help. You're not invisible and neither is God. <laughs> That's what Hagar discovered when she fled into the desert. He sees me. He knows my name. And I see him. And I call him the God who sees me. It's a rarity where a human gives a name to God. The God who sees me. This slave, this servant, immigrant, abandoned, used. And an interaction with God that is rare. Yet God keeps speaking to us even this day. Just because you can't see God doesn't mean that he is not there. Just because you think he is not there doesn't mean he doesn't see you. Just because he, you can't see him doing anything immediately does not mean he is not doing something. To be seen does not mean you won't fall, but he will help you to get back up. Falling is part of life. <laughs> but God doesn't stop everything that hurts us, but he'll help to heal us, and he'll never abandon us. So God sees you now. Fix your eyes on Jesus, right? The author and perfecter of our faith, through the joy set before him, endured the cross, scorning his shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him <laughs> who endured right, opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. So take courage this day. 
that there is a God who sees you, God who knows you, God who helps you. Come to him as mercy and his grace. And some of us need to do this because of your circumstances right now, and all of us need to acknowledge his goodness to us. I encourage you to do that. And we're going to pray, and I'm going to pray. We're going to sing. So God, you are the God who sees us. You see every person in every place You see all things, and you know us by name. You call us by name. And you are faithful. We sang about that this day. You are good. We sang about that this day. And God, I ask on behalf of the people here gathered in this place, gathered online, that we will again sing of the goodness of God, that we will again reach for the grace of God, that we will again look for the mercy of God. And God, I know that you will meet us. And I ask, meet us, God. Open our eyes. Open our ears. Open our hearts, God. To see the God who sees us. Strengthen, we ask. Encourage, we ask. Be among us in a particular way, a peculiar way. Help the truth of your word to grow deeply in our hearts. We rest in you. We're grateful you, we trust in you. <laughs> Show your goodness among us, God. Lead us Give us the strength for your rod and your staff to comfort us. We trust in you, our good, good shepherd. You hem us in like a father. You watch over us like a mother. You walk beside us like a brother. We give you praise in Jesus.